Good evening, St. Helena's Episcopal Church and School, and good evening, and welcome to all of you who have joined us for this Lenten series called Holy Encounters, Then and Now. I'm so, so glad that you've joined us tonight, and it's my pleasure to be part of this series along with Father Brian. This is the first of five sessions on this topic of Holy Encounters. And why don't we start with a prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God, his blessed Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Mercifully give us faith to perceive that according to his promise, he abides with his church on earth, even to the end of the ages. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. Well, again, welcome to our series called Holy Encounters. And to just give you an introduction to why we picked this topic, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, we talk often about the Holy Land. It's on the news. We talk about it when uh, we read from Scripture. And we often, when we think about the Holy Land, think about Palestine and Israel but all land is holy. We talk about holy ground, but all ground is holy ground. And all land is holy land, and all ground is holy ground because our holy creating God made it with his own hands, formed it with his own hands. So all ground is holy ground, and all ground is good ground. When we read the scriptures, we find that human beings throughout the Old and New Testaments often frequently had encounters with holiness, had encounters with the Holy One, had encounters with God, or an angel of the Lord, or Jesus the Son of God, or the Holy Spirit. They had these encounters in physical places, specific places. I mean, think about all of the stories in Scripture about things that happened where people encountered God or experienced the kingdom on shorelines. Think about the feeding of the 5,000, uh, which is told twice in the Gospel of Mark and the only miracle story told in all four of the Gospels. It happens on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus calling fishermen to fish for people that encounter between fishermen and the Son of God happens on a shoreline. Jesus sits in a boat and teaches people on the shore. Another place that human beings encounter the holy is on roads, on roads. In the New Testament, you think of the road to Emmaus story, one of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus that happens as two disciples are walking on a road. Think about how many stories about the Old Testament and the New Testament happen on mountain tops. Moses goes up on the mountain and God gives him the Ten Commandments to bring down to the people. He encounters the Holy so much that his face literally shines with the radiance of holiness. Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount. And just the last Sunday of Epiphany, right before Lent started, the Sunday we had to cancel because of ice and snow, the gospel story was the story of Jesus' transfiguration on top of a mountain. So a lot of things happen, a lot of encounters happen between God and human beings on mountaintops. So people encounter the holy in physical locations on this holy ground, this earth our fragile island home, as our prayer book says. Tonight, we wanted to start with one of these places, these specific places, and tonight, our first session of five, we wanted to talk about gardens as a place where people encounter the holy, both in Scripture and today. So let's start with Scripture. The Scripture in the Old Testament and New Testament are full of images of gardens. 
And in fact, you could say the scripture begins and ends in a garden. Of course, the story in Genesis of the Garden of Eden. God creates heavens and the earth and plants and animals and human beings. And God places Adam and Eve in a garden and he provides for them everything that they need. And he puts them there to tend the garden. One of my favorite images from the Genesis story about the Garden of Eden is in chapter 3, verse 8. And it says this, it says, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. You get this very anthropomorphic image of God after a long day, a hot day, strolling in the shade of the garden just as it begins to cool off the end of the day and the breeze begins to pick up. It's a beautiful image of God walking in a garden. And we can say that scripture ends in a garden uh, after the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, the story in Revelation is paradise restored. Um, that intimate relationship that God had walking in the garden with Adam and Eve is restored in at the end of the story as uh, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. God comes to us and makes his dwelling among human beings. We don't figure out how to get to God. God comes to us. And in the very last chapter of the Revelation to John is this description of the new Jerusalem. And there is a river coming out of the city, the river of the waters of life. And we're told that on each side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 different kinds of fruit. You get this image of an orchard and abundant and a great variety of fruit. And so we could say scripture begins and ends in gardens. And then in between, when we talk about Think about gardens and how often Jesus used images from planting and harvesting and agriculture for telling us about what the kingdom of God is like. One of his very first parables is the parable of a sower who goes out to sow and he radically casts his seed and some falls on the path and some falls on rocky ground and some falls among the thorns and some falls on good soil and grows up and bears fruit abundantly and exponentially. It's a story about gardening and farming. A couple of other parables just off the top of my head that I listed that have agricultural or farming gardening images. Uh, Jesus talks about the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds that grows into a tree big enough for birds of the air to make their nests. Jesus tells parables about a tree that doesn't bear fruit. And the owner says, cut it down. And the gardener says, no, let me, let me dig around it and fertilize it for another year and see if it produces fruit. And if it doesn't, then, then you can cut it down. A parable about mercy. Jesus' own words about the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. An image of harvesting. One of my favorite parables uh, is about wheat and weeds that grow up together. And the gardener wants to pull up the weeds, but the farmer says, no, wait, wait. You know, you might accidentally uproot the good wheat when you pull up the weeds. So let's wait until after the harvest. Let them grow together until after the harvest. So, so much so much of Jesus' teaching, so much of his parables used agricultural, agrarian imagery and imagery from gardening and planting and sowing and reaping and harvesting. Gardens were important in Jesus' life. And as we move through the season of Lent and as we approach in just a few weeks, Holy Week, so many of the events of Holy Week happen in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is just across the Kidron Valley from the city of Jerusalem. Kidron Valley is a very steep valley toward Bethany. 
And evidently, Jesus and his disciples spent time there quite often. They knew the place well. When great feasts were happening, like the Feast of Passover in Jerusalem, the city was full of people. There weren't enough rooms for everybody to stay. And people would literally camp out in the surrounding areas. And the Garden of Gethsemane is really a, not a garden like we think of a flower garden or a vegetable garden. It's really an olive orchard. It's that kind of a garden. And I'm sure Jesus and his disciples often camped out there when they didn't go back to Bethany and stay with their friends. So if you think about all the events that happen in a garden in Holy Week, Jesus goes to the garden after the Last Supper, and there he prays. He prays in the garden. If you remember this story, Jesus goes there to pray about God's will for the next steps in his ministry. And he prays that really, really well-known prayer about, Lord, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. That prayer happens in a garden. Jesus goes there to pray and to seek God's will. And if we think about it, Jesus is betrayed in the garden. Judas leads the soldiers and Jewish leaders to find him there because he knew that was a place that Jesus and his disciples went. So Jesus is betrayed in the garden. Jesus is arrested in the garden. And then after Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus is laid in a tomb in a garden. He's laid in a garden tomb. So much of what happens in Holy Week, those events of Jesus' passion, his life and his passion and eventually his resurrection, happen in a garden. Well, what about today? Those are just some of the stories of holy encounters that happen in gardens. What about today? Because people encountered the holy in gardens then, and in orchards and in fields, people still encounter the Lord in gardens today. I grew up in a family that always had a vegetable garden. We always had tomatoes, and we always had carrots, and we always had uh, beans and uh, we planted a garden every spring and we harvested it all summer long and we had peach trees my grandfather who lived here in Bernie for a while uh, when he moved back in San Antonio he had fig trees and pomegranate trees and peach trees and he had a vegetable garden and he planted blackberries and he had honeybees uh, he was very much a farmer he'd grown up on a farm and he kept on gardening his whole life and so my life growing up we always were gardening and my mom always planted flowers and flower beds and cutting flowers and things in gardens around our backyard and for many years I always had vegetable gardens Jackie actually does it for quite a bit now we have garden at our house and we have tomatoes and we have carrots and we did broccoli as a fall crop and we did lettuce and so we always have some vegetables growing in our gardens. And it dawned on me as I began to garden as an adult that when we're gardening, when we're tilling and planting and getting our hands dirty, that we are getting in touch with creation. When we're gardening, we are participating in creation because gardening is all about life and about fruit and about abundance and even if we have just a you know a pot with a tomato plant in it we are participating in the creation process that began when God created holy ground when God created the heavens and the earth that little collect I read is from Ascension Day and it tells us that Christ ascended into heaven so that he might fill all things fill all creation and that he died and rose again to redeem not just human beings but to redeem all of creation that is in the process of becoming more than it is right now when we garden we are participating in a small way 
in the creative process of God. I know for me that when I've gardened, that some of Jesus' parables become much more alive for me if I think about them when I'm gardening, especially, I mentioned earlier, that parable about wheat and weeds. You know, a lot of gardening, especially in this part of Texas in my yard, involves pulling a lot of weeds in the springtime. And so thinking about pulling weeds and not uprooting the fruit as you do it, you know, what was Jesus saying about the kingdom of God when he was saying, no, leave the wheat with the weeds. Leave them together until the harvest. It's like he's giving weeds a chance to become wheat. You know, he's patient, giving things an opportunity to transform, to become something else. And so I find that, you know, weeds and seeds and abundance and harvest, those kind of parables and teachings, uh, I'm more in touch with them when I am keeping a vegetable garden in my own yard. And of course, gardening or strolling through a beautiful garden or sitting on a bench in a garden or even mowing the yard can be a time of prayer and a time of reflection and a time of seeking God's will and a time of listening and a time of peace. Gardens are often quiet places, beautiful places, sometimes isolated places where we can go and encounter the living God and more easily hear what God might have to say to us in that moment and in that day. One of my favorite passages to read during Lent comes out of Isaiah. And about two weeks ago, the staff and I did a little Bible study at our staff meeting on Isaiah 58 and 59. Or you can do 57, 58, and 59. If you're looking for a little Bible study to do on your own, read those chapters of Isaiah, especially 58 and 59, um, and reflect on them. But one of the things that Isaiah 58 says is this. I'm going to start at um, verse 6. 58, verse 6. Is not the, this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly, your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. I love that passage from Isaiah, where Isaiah, on behalf of God, is saying to the people of God, um, you know, do justice, love kindness, do mercy, act justly, set prisoners free, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. And then when you put your faith into action, you will be like a watered garden, an abundant, fruitful garden. That's what you will be like when you do these things. So in terms of takeaways, I encourage you, if you're not a gardener or never have been, uh, to do something in the weeks ahead to get your hands dirty. You don't have to go out and dig up, you know, an acre of your yard or a corner of your yard and plant a traditional garden. You could just get one pot, put some good soil and fertilizer in it and plant tomatoes because everybody in the South and in Texas grows tomatoes. Uh, but do something, or you could even put a 
plant a small plant and have it in your house or in your room, your office. Uh, but do something that gets your hands dirty and gets you involved in participating with God in creation. It makes you reflect just a little bit on encountering God in the holy ground, the stuff, the dirt of creation. And then finally, I wanna offer you an opportunity uh, that came to me from Camp Capers, our Dawson Camp right up the road up here in Waring. Uh, at Camp Capers is a huge, beautiful garden. It's fenced in to keep the deer from eating everything in it. It has raised beds and it has uh, fruit trees at one end of it and they actually harvest out of it for some of the kitchen, uh, some of the ingredients of the kitchen at camp. They're looking for people who like to garden, who live in this area, who might want to come up and help out from time to time in the garden at Camp Keepers. So if you're a gardener or you'd like to be a gardener, you'd like to help out from time to time with that, um, shoot me an email and I'll get you in contact uh, with the good folks at Camp Capers right up the road, right here in Kendall County. Uh, and you can be part of gardening in a really beautiful garden there. So shoot me an email at rector at st. or give us a call in our office and I'll be happy to tell you a little more about it and get you in touch with the people at Camp Capers if you're interested. So let me know. So thank you again for joining us uh, for this first session on Holy Encounters. Father Brian will be doing the next one and it'll be up on our website, our, our, our YouTube channel on Wednesday, next Wednesday uh, by six o'clock. Uh, look forward to seeing you uh, in the days ahead at St. Helena's or online. God bless you and take care.